We're going to talk about uh, Python and uh, PostgreSQL. So who's using your PostgreSQL already? Yeah, m most of you. Not, not everybody, but cool. So I've been using uh, Python uh, for a long time. I, I began in uh, Python 1.5.2, so that, that was quite some time ago. And uh, I've been using PostgreSQL for uh, almost as long. And uh, I'm now a PostgreSQL major contributor, uh, which is a role that uh, the PostgreSQL community uh, attributes to people when they uh, uh, contribute uh, for a long enough time. So I, I have a couple uh, features in PostgreSQL that I, uh, uh, that I had uh, contributed to the product. Like uh, if you do create extension, it's a little scary because you run my code. So <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, PostgreSQL. And currently I'm working at Citus Data. What we do is uh, a distributed PostgreSQL. So if you take PostgreSQL and uh, you have too many transactions or too, too many data into it, you can have it in uh, many different servers. And each one of them is going to have a, only a part of the data, the same schema everywhere, but only a part of the data. It's called uh, sharding. And uh, we do that in a trans transactional way. So it's, uh, it's quite nice. So if you, uh, if you have uh, troubles with uh, scaling out PostgreSQL, uh, have a look at Citus data. We do uh, uh, nice things. Uh, most of the examples I'm going to, uh, to pick here uh, today uh, come from a book I wrote uh, last year. Uh, it's called uh, Mastering PostgreSQL in Application Development. So it's a book about PostgreSQL and it's meant to be read by uh, developers so, uh, like you guys. And uh, the intent is to teach uh, PostgreSQL and uh, how to turn like, uh, let's say, uh, thousands of lines of code into a simple uh, SQL queries. I found that most of the time developers, they don't know what to do with really with uh, SQL, what is possible to do even. So it's all about that. And uh, you have a discount if you want to use it. Yeah, of course, <laughs> because we love Python. And so uh, if you use uh, this uh, offer code, you will have the, this discount. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not uh, using PostgreSQL yet, uh, check out uh, PG Loader. Uh, it can uh, do a full migration in uh, one command line. Basically, you do PG Loader. Uh, the um, connection string uh, of the source database, the connection string of the target database, which must be PostgreSQL, and it automates everything, uh, schema, data, indexes, constraints, uh, everything is migrated into one command. So it's really easy. So I, uh, I did write that so that you, you have no excuses. If you're not using PostgreSQL yet, you just one command line and then you can use it. So no excuse, okay? Okay, so let's get started now. Why would anyone use a, a relational database management system, RDBMS? It's a mouthful, it's complex to say, it's complex to use. Uh, w w what is good about it? So the, the main answer I get uh, from developers when we talk together, uh, it's like it's for uh, uh, saving the data, okay, serialization. It's a place to uh, save data. But everybody knows how to open a file for writing or for reading. So saving data, you don't need a rational database management system for doing that, right? If you just want to save data, open a file, uh, put it into it, and that's it, it's done. Uh, if you're doing Java, the file is going to be XML, because that's what they do. In Python, maybe you're doing more JSON than XML, so maybe a, a JSON file or something like that, and uh, it's going to be uh, uh, solving the the problem of saving a file, or data storage. So uh, database management systems are not about storage. Right, so what is it all about? It's all about concurrency and isolation. Uh, concurrency means uh, accessing the data uh, from several um, active connections at a time. Uh, let's say uh, you are doing um, a web front end in, in, uh, in Python, so there is the what we call the client code, when uh, we look at things from the dat database, uh, the client code is going to be your backend code uh, written in Python, right? And you, you're going to have uh, multiple instances running in parallel of your backend code. Let's say if it's a web service, you will have uh, one backend active per um, cur um, currently connected user. So you will have many users, maybe, doing things concurrently and you want your system to be consistent at all time. That's when you use a relational database management system. The system is going to ensure that the data is uh, uh, safe and uh, consistent uh, for, for everyone to use in parallel, in a 
in a concurrent way. So let's dig into that a little. Uh, concurrency in database system, it begins with uh, the, the famous ACID uh, letter. So everybody's have heard about ACID, I guess. And uh, we're going to talk about it a little uh, in a practical way. So uh, to be ACID, you need to be atomic. The, the, the really important thing about ACID is that most of us, that's all we learned about uh, RDBMS at, in, when we got started at school or maybe elsewhere uh, to develop. And so it's something we kind of trust the database with. So if I get back to this uh, slide, when you pick a, a, a database management system solution, there are many, many out there uh, today. And most of them are not ACID because they're like, if, if we drop one of the letters, it's going to be much easier to implement like scaling out or things distributed transactions. So if you take uh, uh, Cassandra, for example, do you have uh, uh, ACDT or not? It's an important question because if you think that as a developer that you have it but you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I like to pick on MongoDB because it's so easy. So which ones of the letter uh, does MongoDB have in ACID? Well, it doesn't have transactions, so you lose the A and you lose the I, right? It does, it's schemaless by design. So it means it cannot handle consistency. because it, is, it knows nothing about the data. By definition, it's schemaless. And it used to be not durable, <laughs> okay? So zero of the four letters. So, but maybe it's okay for your application to deal with a, a system that has nothing to do with ACID. But you need to remember uh, that either you have it or you don't, and uh, what it means when you write the code. So atomic means you can do rollback. So when you send the commit message uh, to the database, uh, it's a command that may succeed or fail. So in your code, each time you send a commit message, you are supposed to check that the message uh, that you get back is actually a commit and not a rollback, okay? So for example, if you select uh, one divided by zero, that they're going to be an error, divide, division by zero, we, can, we don't know how to do that. And so then if you say commit, the message will roll back. Uh, you cannot commit a transaction uh, when there was an error before. Okay? Another uh, nice situation where you may have a rollback when you ask for a commit is file system is full. So you do a transaction, read only, write, do something, and then when you commit, the message you get back is a rollback, file system is full. Sorry about that. You, you can continue reading the data but not writing to it. And in PostgreSQL, it's pretty nice because when you have that, file system is full, what happens is the PostgreSQL just continues running until you make some uh, room for it. So maybe you have this uh, delete.me file that is like uh, one terabyte uh, big. And so when you have file system is full, you, is full, you go, you delete this file. It, it's, it's called uh, delete me for a reason. So you delete it. And then you can continue working and fix the problem the next day, maybe when you are woken up for real. So that's a nice trick. And it works very well with uh, PostgreSQL. So remember that, that um, transactions, when you write Python code, maybe you're like, yeah, I don't really need that. But then think about that. What happens if file system is full in the middle of your transaction? You're writing things. And uh, you're supposed to be writing two things, and in between the two, file system is full. What's next? If you're using PostgreSQL, you don't care because you, you just have a rollback instead of a commit, and you can continue. Okay, it's easy to handle. Uh, consistency uh, means that um, uh, we'll get back to consistent in a minute. But uh, basically, consistency is that you know what you have in your data, data set. You can trust your data. So to know what you have in the data set, you need to have a schema. So you need to declare. Uh, your intention, but uh, like you do when you write code. If you want to write nice code, you need to declare your intention. Otherwise, people are going to have to uh, reverse engineer every single line of code you, you wrote. It's, in the same, it's the same thing. So uh, you have a structured um, data model that you can use. And the first uh, consistency uh, uh, bits that we're going to use in PostgreSQL are the data types. Uh, we have very uh, a large set of data types. There are in the default PostgreSQL setup, you have 72 data types. Okay, it's just not just integers and text. You can have points, you can have uh, uh, circles, you can have many things. Uh, so the first thing is that the, the data looks like what uh, it should look like. So that's the data type, and then you have the constraints like not null or pr primary key, foreign key. And um, so some people would think that uh, uh, we call it relational because there is foreign keys. 
Uh, that's not true, so don't think about it that way. Uh, we're going to get back on relations and what they are in SQL. Uh, the fact that you have a foreign key has nothing to do with the fact that we call it a relational database management system. So we'll get back to that if you want. And you have SQL uh, to uh, process the data. And so in the room, who likes to write SQL queries? Yeah, not many of us, okay, that's fine. M my hope is that by the end of the talk, m more, more people will uh, show, show uh, their hand. So consistent, it, it's important. And uh, because uh, you have a, a view of the system, of the whole system that is running, uh, you have the, the whole view of it in PostgreSQL, in your database. Uh, in your Python code, usually you, have, uh, you are implementing a user workflow, so you're doing things for one user at a time. So it's easy to handle uh, that the, whatever you do is consistent for one user, but how do you make it consistent for the whole system? Like if you are um, managing a, a stock system, uh, so one guy can uh, buy the last item, but not two of them because there is only one. Right? So for each guy, it's easy to be consistent, but to have a view of the whole system, it's going to be uh, back to the uh, database management system to handle that. Uh, the I in ACID is for uh, isolation. Uh, it's easy to um, uh, mix atomicity and uh, isolation. It's the, it's the other side of the same thing. Isolating means that uh, during your own transaction, you begin, you can do whatever you want. Uh, um, so atomic means nobody sees what you're doing until you commit. Isolated means uh, you have a choice of uh, whether you want to see uh, what the other guy did or not during your own transaction. PG dump, for example, so it's a logical backup of your database. It needs to not see whatever happens. So when you be, uh, PGDump will do a begin and then select uh, from tables. And it wants to see the same snapshot of the database during all its processing. So it's going to say, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to see anything that happens. If someone is doing an insert and commit, uh, in between I do the select from this table and the select from this other table, I don't want to see the, the insert at all. Uh, I want to have a consistent backup. And so PGDump is going to uh, start a transaction in a, uh, either a serializable mode or a read repeated mode. But your Python code too is going to have the same um, setup. So you can choose for your uh, backend application to be in a read committed or um, the default is a, so read committed is the default or repeatable read, which means that if I do a select and then another select, I'm going to see exactly the same data as long as I'm in the same transaction. Right? By default, if you do a select kun star from the table, then someone else does an insert and then, then you select kun star again you see one more, okay? Count plus one, count, you have one more. But if you say I'm in a repeatable read, you don't see the other guy doing the insert. So you're guaranteed to have the same data set for the, the whole processing. If you're doing invoicing or financial uh, reporting or things like that, maybe it's important that your application code only sees the same snapshot of the data for each of and every query it's running. So that's isolation. It's, it's another part of, uh, of the ACID deal. And then durable. So do you know the, this test with the uh, socket plug? You write a simple uh, Python client that will do uh, inserts in a database. So begin, insert, commit. And uh, in the um, client code, you, you count how many inserts you did. And while the test is running, you unplugged the power socket from the server, from the PostgreSQL server in the middle of the testing, you unplug it. Then you plug it again, and the PostgreSQL will be like, oh, uh, there was a crash, I'm going to recover the data I have. And then you do the count again. Uh, everything you counted in on the client, you must have it in on the server. If you don't, it's not durable. So with PostgreSQL, if the count don't match, it's either because you have a bug in your application, you counted things that were not known to be committed. So you, you, you did count how many times you sent the commit message and not how many times you received it. But that's a trick. Or it's because it's mis misconfigured. Or maybe there is a bug in PostgreSQL, but uh, every user is doing that in PostgreSQL to test. So it would be surprising that we still have bug in uh, that area. And if you're using a, a system that is not durable, uh, well, you can maybe throw it away and uh, set up another one because it's usually not what you want. So that was uh, more the intro, and uh, uh, let's see how to use that in uh, your uh, application code in, 
when you're writing Python. So, as I said before, the, the main trick about consistency is that the Python code, the backend, is going to implement a user workflow. So the, most of the code you write uh, will be tied to one user doing uh, something. The, a good way to see the that database management system is that it's, it's going to handle the, the whole system. All the transactions that are happening in parallel are going to be uh, handled into a single system that can be the system of truth and that it's going to implement the business rules and uh, the constraints that you need. Uh, when, you, when we think about constraints, um, we think that uh, it's something that, uh, that is hard to handle because it's, nobody wants to have constraints, right? We want to be free and do whatever we want, it's easier. Uh, so another way to say it is that um, rather than uh, naming them constraints, you can name them guarantees. PostgreSQL is going to guarantee that uh, the data you, you put into it uh, makes sense for your application and for your business, for your users and for every situation you have. So you can say, for example, uh, uh, in this table, uh, it only makes sense to have um, uh, an entity there if there is another one in this other table. I want the guarantee, the strong guarantee by the system that whatever I do in the application code, uh, this constraint or this relationship or this uh, uh, element is uh, uh, true at every time. So PostgreSQL is going to handle that for you. And uh, remember, so that's a, an old uh, quote for, uh, from the 70s, I think. Uh, uh, this one is from uh, Rob Pike. He, he wrote uh, Go uh, recently. He was working a lot in, uh, in the early days of Unix in the 70s, and he did many interesting things in the uh, 80s and 19s. And it's about writing code in C in the 70s, but it's still true today. Data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithm will almost be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. In terms of Python programming, when you, it, it means that if you pick your data structures and your classes and etc. right, then all the code is going to be so easy to read and maintain that nobody is going to ask questions. And this, the part of uh, PostgreSQL where it requires a schema, at the beginning when you don't really know what you're doing, you're like, eh, I'd prefer to you know, just do some JSON documents and uh, I'll figure it out later. So sometimes it's a burden to say, uh, I need to specify exactly the schema, etc. But it provides also a, a lot of clarity about your intention and what you're going to handle and what are the situations you want to be handling and what are the situations that should not happen in your application. You can see all that just by looking at the SQL schema. So uh, when you design your, uh, uh, your code in terms of data structures or classes in, in Python, uh, well, it's the same uh, mental model that uh, we can apply to the schema. Uh, let's see uh, some examples, practical examples with, uh, so we're going to see lots of data and uh, SQL queries and Python scripts, etc. Uh, I, I picked that uh, example because the data is easily available. Uh, here the schema is, uh, so if we do that, yeah, so you see it's all numbers, but some of them have uh, the dollar sign, so it's a currency number, uh, dates and things like that, so we have uh, the year is an int, the, the date year, and then it's all text because commas and things to parse, etc. But we are, are not actually using text here. So the next thing we do is a, a single outer table statement that is going to change the type of three columns and say it begins. And uh, we're using this kind of expressions to transform the text that we received into uh, something that for PostgreSQL looks uh, like numbers and that we can actually use, okay? So who knew you could do a, a three uh, retyping of columns into a single article table statement? So that go, that's going to ensure a single table rewrite. And uh, using like uh, uh, replace, substrings, and things like that, you could use uh, regular expressions and uh, splits and uh, whatever. So who knew you could do that in SQL? Okay, not many of you guys. So nice to have you. So, one of the first things people say, because SQL, the, 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 it's structural query language and it's a, uh, declarative. So, uh, SQL is a pro programming language, right? Maybe not many of you think of it that way. But SQL is a programming language. It, it happens to be declarative. So, rather than explaining to the computer how to do the things, what you do in SQL, you explain the results you want to have. 
So you tell the result you need, and PostgreSQL is going to figure out how to make it happen. So one of the things that are difficult for uh, uh, programmers who are used to do imperative programming or uh, object-oriented programming is that uh, they, they're not having the will this time. They're just expressing the need and not how to do it. So one of the questions usually is, uh, yeah, but how do I check about uh, the implementation? Is, is, it going to, is it going to use the good algorithm when I do this query, etc.? So let's see about that. I'm not sure you can read that. Maybe, yeah, can you read that? Yeah, it's good. So it's a, a single, a simple uh, top N. So N here is a 10. So we're going to take the 10 uh, lines with the uh, uh, bigger numbers. So you can see the result on the, on the right of the, of the slide here, okay? So each time I want the date and the maximum number and I want them uh, like the, the 10 most numbers. In Python, it's easy to do. You do a heap queue, okay, and then you uh, you use this method heap push pop. So it's going to uh, maintain an, a heap of only ten elements, and each time there is a bigger element, it's going to uh, keep it in memory. And you only have ten elements in memory at all time during uh, running that program. If you have one million lines of input, you only have ten lines at a time into the top ten. <coughs> okay, that's what you want, right? You, you don't want to uh, load one million lines in memory, sort them all, and then uh, find out the 10 greatest. So you do that uh, reading the file and you keep only uh, 10 lines in memory. So that's EPQ for you. It's a standard lib, so you do just uh, import EPQ. It's easy to do, and at the end you, d you just get the, the 10 largest from the heap. Okay, so it's uh, really easy to do in Python. So how to do that in SQL? Well, it's even easier, right? Just say, please sort them by dollars and I want the, the first 10, and that's it. But, so, so it's the, the same thing as the, this code in uh, Python. If you want to do it in SQL, it, it, it's written that way. But how do you make sure that uh, it's actually going to do uh, uh, the same thing as the heap sort we implemented by hand before? Where if you're using PostgreSQL, you do an explain. So you can actually type that at the, at the shell prompt in psql, explain, uh, with the options analyze, verbose, and buffers. And then you continue with the query we saw on the previous slide. And that's the output, typically you get something like that. And one of the, because it's verbose, so because it's analyzed, it's going to actually run the query and uh, measure everything, and then uh, give you the answers, the, all the stats you have here, like execution time, uh, one something millisecond, etc. And you can see that the sort method here is a top end heap sort that used only 25 kilobytes of memory. So it's exactly the implementation we had before in Python. The nice thing about it is that uh, if this um, uh, amount of memory, let's say you did a, a top 1000 heap sort or something like that, if it doesn't fit in memory anymore, PostgreSQL we know how to spill to disk and then uh, use uh, a specific algorithm uh, from Knuth from the 80s that is called the tape sort. And it's going to use that to merge uh, files on disk and obtain the top n in the right order, etc. Which would be like complex to write in Python. You do really don't really want to do that. But in PostgreSQL, to write a smart algorithm that fits in memory but uh, spill to disk when it has to, etc., you just need to write order by dollars disk. That's it. That's all you need to do. Uh, any questions so far? No? Good. So the, usually the first assignment you have with the financial dat data is to do reports, so it's a little boring, but let's do a monthly report. Uh, that syntax, you can actually use it in psql. So you can have a, like a, a variable that then you can use this way. Okay, so if you're not used to using uh, the psql command line, uh, just play around with it, it's very nice. Uh, you can even have a you have a command backslash e, like editor, and you can uh, associate it to your favorite editor, be it, I don't know, Emacs, VI, whatever. And so you can edit your queries in line in psql using your usual editor, so that's pretty nice. You can set variables, so you can run the query again and again with different dates and things like that. Uh, so that's a very uh, easy query, right? Everybody would be able to write that like easily on the keyboard, I guess. It's really uh, SQL 101. And it looks like this. So uh, no surprise here. Uh, oops. 
Of course, I pick February because otherwise it's not fun. Okay, and uh, we only have 19 rows for 28 days. We have like gaps in here because there were days in the data without activity. So maybe we want to fix that. Let's fix that. We want the monthly report, but we want all the days. So we're going to use a calendar and uh, iterate in the calendar. And uh, if there is no data, we're going to use zero, right? Easy. It's really simple uh, Python programming. And so now we have all the days in February with zero when there is no activity. But when you do that, you, you need to think about something. Where is that code going to be used? Uh, if it's only in one program, then fine, sure. But now if you have that in the maybe user uh, dashboard, uh, maybe uh, in the admin panel uh, dashboards, maybe in the back office, maybe in the financial and uh, reporting activity, maybe in several places you need to do the same thing again and again. So a nice way to do that would be that it would be written directly in the SQL query. So do you know how to implement days with no activity in SQL? Yes, okay, so let's uh, see about that. It's, it's quite easy with PostgreSQL. We have generate series. So we can tell PostgreSQL, please generate one month of dates with a, a one day interval in between uh, each step of the series. It's, it's a loop of one day step, one, one day at a time. So we step one day from the start to the end. In the end is uh, the start plus one month but minus one day because we don't want to step into March. We want to stay in February. So plus one month minus one day. Okay. So we do a generate series and we do, of course, a left, left join because we want our main uh, reference pivot table is going to be the dates from February. And for each date, I'm going to pick up, do I have data to go with it? If I have, I used it. And if I don't, uh, in SQL, I have null. And uh, here, you see, Coalice. This function is, uh, if I have null, as, uh, so the, you have as many parameters as you want to the function. And um, it will pick the first one of the parameters that is not null. So Coalesce, calendar dot entry, uh, sorry, uh, shares zero. So if shares is not null, it, it will keep shares. If it's null, it will take zero instead. Who could have written this SQL without uh, ins of uh, Coalis, left join, and generate series? Okay, so that's like SQL from the, from the 80s guy. You could do that in, in the 80s already. So if you don't know how to do that, you don't know SQL at all. It's like, it's not even the basics. We're going to get into interesting things later, but this, this thing, like, it's, it's not really even SQL. It's like the 101, it's the, the easiest thing in the world. So if you don't like SQL, but you don't know how to do that, you don't like it because you didn't learn it. So please learn it and then have an opinion. But for now, you, can, you cannot have an opinion, I'm sorry. You, you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so that, that's really, that should be like a, a snap by the finger. You're like, oh, I need to do that, clack, clack, done. Really, it's not interesting. And uh, the result looks like this, of course. So with uh, zeros instead of uh, the numbers when you don't have them. And uh, we have the 20 rows, 28 rows. And what's nice about it is that uh, you don't need to know that February is only 28 days long. You just say one month. And PostgreSQL is going to figure out how many days there is in this month because you're going to attach with the plus sign here. So when we say that the consistency of the data, the first thing we use for that is the, the, the types. Here we use a date and a month, an interval, sorry. And the, the plus sign, it's, it, in PostgreSQL, the, the plus sign is, it's like if you do object-oriented programming in Python and you have two classes and uh, you implement an operator uh, in between the two classes, it's the same thing. So the plus sign here is not the same implementation, of course, if it's two integers or a date and an interval or two dates maybe, or a, a point in a circle or a, an IP address in an IP address range or things like that. So the, it's object-oriented programming here. And you can actually uh, uh, implement your own operators in PostgreSQL if you want to. And uh, you can even do that in Python with uh, PL Python if you need to. So first learn SQL, but then if you have, like if you want to share more code in between your backend code and your PostgreSQL uh, processing, then you can uh, basically import your Python code directly in your database server if you need to. It's easy to do. Um, so the next thing uh, we want from this query, and, and then we're going, to, we're going to begin to do some SQL. 
week on week evolution. So here you can see the result we want. Like this one day, Wednesday, we did 10% uh, less than the, the one before. This Wednesday, 7% more than this one. Who knows how to do that in SQL? Now it's SQL from uh, oh, this time uh, 92. Uh, like, you know, uh, Unicode or uh, IPv6. Like things that everybody have, right? <laughs> okay, so it, it, it's SQL from the from 90s. So you should know to do that. Uh, so let's see about uh, how to do that in SQL. Uh, the query is a little longer, but if you remember this query, it's the one from the slide a little <coughs> earlier. It's the one with the generic series that get the, the whole month, okay? Uh, the left join, etc. And we just give it a name, computed data. So with is called a common table expression. Is something you use in SQL to give a, an alias to a query, and then you can reuse it. So computed data is going to be here in the from clause. Okay, so we get this data and we play with it here. And what we do is uh, when dollar is not nil and not zero, then we are going to compare to last week dollar here. And what is that? It comes from here. It's, it's using a window function that is called lag. We're going to partition the data by iso though it means day of week. Like Monday is one, Tuesday is two, etc. And uh, of course, some people will say that Monday is uh, two because Sunday is one, and some people will say, no, you're crazy, Sunday is zero, so Monday is one. So we need to agree on the standard, and so there is an ISO standard to figure out you know, which day is which number. And uh, so we partition by that, and we order by date, and uh, we lag one step behind, and one step behind in the data set is going to be the with the same uh, day of week number, it's going to be one week before, the Wednesday before, for example, okay? So it's really easy in, in SQL uh, to have uh, this, where you can see the data from last week uh, when you're uh, processing that row. Who knew you could do that in SQL? Okay, that's SQL from the 90s this time. It's from 92, okay? It, it was in the standard in 92, which means that may, more than one implementation already had it in 92 when they added it to the standard, okay? Uh, and of course the results uh, look like this. I, I just added the colors, it's, the, it's a copy paste from the terminal. I just added some colors for you to be easier to read. And so when I said it's from uh, 92, the current standard is from uh, 2016. And the way to read the number after the, the SQL uh, name in the standard is that any version that was issued before that is cancelled, it's not valid anymore. You, 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 if you say uh, SQL standard, the current one is SQL 2016, any other one is deprecated. Okay, so if you know how to do SQL 99, 89, most people learn uh, SQL, when they learn SQL, they actually learn SQL 89, 89 sorry. Some people are lucky enough that they have a, a glimpse at SQL 92. We are actually in 2016 in terms of SQL standards, okay? So before you say I don't like SQL and I can do nothing uh, in SQL, I need to write Python instead. Um, well, maybe try to refresh your mind about what it means to be doing SQL in, uh, like this year is 2018, I guess, so maybe SQL from the 80s, it's not, yeah, I don't know. So how to think in SQL? Uh, if you, uh, we said it's declarative partitioning. So if you look at other uh, systems like Unix, they say everything is a file. Well, it's not exactly true, but uh, it's what we say. Java, everything is an object. Well, uh, integers are not really objects, uh, but uh, because you, do, you couldn't write plus in between two objects, you need to do integer.add, but it doesn't work actually. Extra. But uh, they say that everything is an object. Uh, in Python, you have more than just objects. So you have packages, module classes. That, that's the kind of thing you, need, you think about when you think in terms of Python. So how do you handle uh, thinking in SQL? How do you think in SQL? Well, you need to think about the relations. So what are relations in SQL? Uh, relation, uh, it, it comes from the um, uh, math of it, right? So in mathematics, a relation is a set of elements that have the same properties. That's it. So in SQL, a relation is a, a set of data 
that share the same uh, uh, domain uh, uh, domain attributes and uh, domain values. So bas basically, it's a, a tuple. A tuple with a T means uh, it's the number of elements you have in a tuple. If you have only two, it's a tuple. If you have only three, it's a triple. If you don't know the number, it's a tuple, T tuple. Okay. So you have many elements, T of them, and each one of them you know exactly the data type of it. And then you have a tuple, and then you can play with them uh, and say that there are relations. So the output of any select query is going to be a relation. Okay. The, the, the thing you do when you, when you do a select query in SQL is uh, describing a relation. But also you have many tricks to, uh, to say where to pick the data from. And uh, the select uh, bits of the syntax, it's uh, the projection query because it describes the output. Okay? It's the project projection operation. And you define the attributes domain when doing that. Uh, from introduces base relations, but uh, as we saw before, the, the from can be a subselect because uh, the output of a select is a relation, and from uh, plays with relations. And then, what can you do in between relations? Well, you can join them with inner, outer, and other kind of joins. So, who knows the difference between inner and outer join? Yeah, okay, that's good. Who knows about lateral join? Join? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so maybe we'll see that. Uh, okay. And you can also in operation uh, with a uh, with a set because a relation is almost like a set. The main difference is that usually when you have a set in mathematics, uh, you don't have duplicates by design. In a relational model, you have a relation, and nobody cares about duplicates. So you may you may have duplicates or you may not have them. Uh, that's why it's important to have a primary key that is not uh, on a data that doesn't make sense. For example, as soon as you have a primary key on top of an integers column that has nothing to do with the data, like for example a serial column, uh, well you don't have a primary key anymore because the fact that this column has a one and this column has a, this tuple has a one and the other one has a two, it means nothing about the data. So you will have many duplicates but with different numbers at the beginning. Right. Nice. Okay. So it's not a primary key anymore in the relational model. It doesn't make sense. This query is just to show uh, relations. So we have a, here, we use a CTE called decades that we are going to reuse in a from somewhere uh, from uh, other by decades. I can't remember, but it's used everywhere. Yeah, drivers, results, races. Decades, yes. And left join lateral. So we have a lateral subquery that is used in a join. The result of the subquery is going to be a, a relation. And lateral allows you to refer decades within the subquery. So you can order by decades, limit three, and order by wins. So basically, we're going to fetch the three drivers that add the most point in the history of Formula One by decade. It looks like this. So in the 50s, it was Fangio. So if you, uh, your father or grandfather used to say, don't, don't drive like a Fangio, it comes from there. Okay. Fangio, and then you can see Prost, and maybe uh, Schumacher is more well known nowadays, Hamilton, etc. So that's the kind of query you, you use. And so the from part of the query is introducing relations. So every step in the query is a different relation, and you can mix and match them together with operators. And the operator is like a left-turn lateral, that's an operator, etc, uh, etc. Et so that's the way to think about uh, SQL, so SQL is code, right? But rather than uh, explaining the algorithm in detail, what you do is explain the output you want to have in terms of relations. That's how you program in SQL. Uh, but if we say that SQL is code, when you write Python code, you have unit testing, uh, integration testing, uh, maybe you have um, uh, some tooling around the fact that you write Python. So can you have that in a SQL uh, integration? So the, the, the thing that I like to do is when I, do a, when I use SQL in, a, in an application is that I'm using SQL files, right? You have files that are uh, foo.pi because it's the foo class implemented in Python. Uh, so I have files .sql files into my source code uh, because SQL is a uh, is code. So I don't want to want to be handling like uh, strings 
that I play around with and then send to PostgreSQL. It's a, a very bad way to write code. And so you would have a, py uh, a SQL file like this. But now you want to do uh, unit testing, regression testing, you want to have parameters, you want to have uh, its code, right? So in Python, you can use a NoSQL. Uh, there are other solutions, but it's the one uh, uh, I did find easily and picked. And so if, the, if you have this file, this SQL file, you see there are two queries there, with uh, they have a name. And, uh, and well, it's really easy query. Uh, but then you can, with AnoSQL, you can load the queries and then use them by the name as if they were uh, function calls. And you have them, give them uh, arguments and parameters and things. So it's really easy to handle SQL into your uh, source code and to edit it. And then you can have a diff and you can review a pull request uh, where you have a diff on the SQL and you can think about it. It's not just uh, a diff that builds a string differently and uh, it has no meaning and you don't know what to compare, it's just a diff in between uh, two SQL files. It's going to be much easier uh, to handle. And then you want regression tests. So there is this tool uh, uh, I wrote. It's based on uh, uh, what PostgreSQL does internally for its own uh, regression testing. The idea is very simple. You have queries and parameters. So you run the queries with the parameters and you check that the output is the same as the one that is expected. So it's really, really easy to implement. And it looks like this. Uh, when you're using it, so you have uh, expected, out, and plans uh, directories. In the plans, you have YAML files that contains the parameters that you want to as uh, uh, associate with the queries, because you have a queries uh, file in SQL that can handle parameters. And then you have uh, expected files. Basically, it's uh, when you run psql, it's the output of it. So you, you run psql, you have an output, you, stay, you say, uh, Sorry, you store that in a file, and then you run the queries again, and you, you do a diff in between the output uh, that was expected and the output that you actually have. So you have regression testing, that's it. It's really easy, you can do that like in a half an hour in Python if you want. So just for the kicks of it, I implemented it in Go because I wanted to see uh, uh, what it would be like to program in Go, but if you want it in Python, it's like, uh, I don't know, within a day you have it. So it's re really easy to uh, actually use uh, uh, SQL as code including uh, in your editor support, because you know you have SQL files and uh, uh, regression testing and uh, uh, diffs and et cetera, et cetera, like in uh, your daily programmer life. Any questions so far? We're going to see a more interesting SQL now. No, good, okay. <laughs> So I, I told you that uh, in PostgreSQL we have 72 different data types by default. So maybe that's not enough, so let's see uh, some other ones. In PostgreSQL it's really easy to install an extension and then uh, play around with it. So one, of, one extension that I like is uh, uh, IP addresses range. So did you know you could do geolocation with a single uh, SQL query? So that, that is an IP address. And this operator, well, it looks a little uh, foreign, right? It looks strange. But if you think about it, uh, using a greater than sign or equal sign, uh, it's something that doesn't make any sense. It's just that we got used to it, right? Uh, the fact that we used two horizontal bars to say that two values are equal to each other, it's something you learn. It's not, there is no logic behind it. So the way to read this one is uh, contains. The IP range contains this IP address. Okay, and uh, just with that, you're going to have a geolocation query. So maybe you're thinking, okay, but I, I can do that in the in the Python code in the in the web backend. I have many backends. It's easy to spin up new servers if I have more load. So why would I do that in SQL? Well, maybe you have metadata that you want to associate uh, with the uh, IP address, like we do here. We actually use the geolocation and we join against another table with more data. What we could do too is uh, compute the distance in between a, a point and uh, another one. So let's say that this is an IP address, uh, or maybe the one of your uh, phone right now or your uh, computer. And you're going to use that and you're going to find, uh, in this query, find every pub around like the, the 10 closest pubs. So it's a query uh, to, to find quickly. Let's say you're really thirsty and you want to find a pub easily. 
And um, so for this query uh, to run, PubNames is extracted uh, from an OpenStreetMap project. So it's easy to fetch in OpenStreetMap the list of all the pubs in France. Or uh, for, uh, I used that first for a conference in uh, Ireland, in Dublin. So I loaded all the pubs from, uh, uh, from Dublin area. And uh, the IP address was the IP address that we got in the hotel of the conference. And uh, here is the query. It's a simple uh, SQL query, right? You can see it fits in the slide, so it's simple. And you have the list of pubs around with the distance in miles. It's, a, it's just a SQL query, right? And uh, there is something in that query that should, that should, uh, uh, that should not pass uh, your testing. It's using a comma here. Comma means uh, cross-join, like it's a Cartesian product. It means that you're going to uh, have as many lines as the first table multiplied by the number of lines of the other table. You're going to do a, a full Cartesian uh, product of the two tables. But here it's okay, why? Because in that table with IP ranges, we have a, a constraint in PostgreSQL that we can implement that says that, uh, uh, that forbids to have overlapping ranges. So uh, I, I didn't put on, uh, on the slides the, uh, how to write it, but it's in the documentation. It's really easy to find. So you can have a table containing all the IP ranges that are given to you by uh, your uh, geolocation provider. And you can say to PostgreSQL, uh, the range is here. They, uh, so we don't see a range, we only see an IP address. But the ranges that we have in the, in the database, I have a guarantee that they are not overlapping. Which means that this query, because we have a single IP address, it's going to return a single range. We know that because there is no overlap allowed. So any given IP address only fits into one range. That's what it means, that you have a, a constraint that there is no overlapping ranges. And that's why I told you that constraints, another way to think about them, it's guarantees. You have the guarantee, the strong guarantee, that this query here is going to return one row only. Or maybe zero, if we don't have the IP address at all, but zero or one, one row, which means that Cartesian product here, that's not a problem, because you multiply by one, so it doesn't change much, right? And then when you see the order by and limit, if you would do an explain of the query, you would see that it's implemented using uh, what we call the KNN search. So K is the number, here K is 10, and NN is for nearest neighbors. So we want the 10 nearest neighbors. And so when you write other by, oh, this one is, uh, you name it distance. So other by distance, limit 10, it's implemented into a single index scan in PostgreSQL, okay? So it's going to scan the index in order, and only the index scan is going to be used to be able to order by position, the distance in between the position of the pub and your location. Limit 10, it's a single uh, index uh, scan. So, so that's pretty efficient. So that's the kind of thing you can do in PostgreSQL, even with, uh, without extension. Here we're using two, uh, two extensions. The one that knows how to do uh, uh, the contain operation in between IP ranges and IP addresses. And the other one is called the earth distance, and it pro it's providing this distance operator that is expressed in miles. Because without it, uh, we, we would use only this one, but it would be only uh, like a Cartesian distance. Uh, because you have coordinates and you do uh, like what you did in a, in, in a classroom uh, back in the day, and you would have like uh, numbers that don't, doesn't mean anything. But with the Earth distance, the two points are actually considered as a location on the Earth, and then uh, you consider it's a sphere, and then you do the more complex calculation. And because an American did it, you have the result in miles. But it's easy to, to convert them to uh, kilometers then. Okay. Uh, another one that I did like is, uh, it's from uh, a MongoDB article where they were uh, so happy to show that they, they know how to uh, aggregate. So when you hear about uh, MapReduce, for example, MapReduce is a kind of an aggregate. Aggregate, we, we did have that in SQL in the 70s already, okay? So, but MongoDB they just had, had that like last year or something like that, so they were really happy about it. And uh, the article was really long and uh, full of examples and things. And uh, they said, so this is a quote from the article, interesting factoid, etc. Uh, so it's, it's about basketball, and in basketball it's uh, really important, the defensive rebounds. It's when someone tries to score a point and uh, 
the, the, the ball doesn't get into it and then it goes out, but then you pick the ball from the uh, opponent and you score. So it's really a, a very good statistics for a basketball when you follow it. And, and they said this interesting factoid, but they didn't uh, show the MongoDB aggregate query that you would need to run to, to find it. So I, I was a little surprised, so I'm like, okay, let's do it in SQL. So we have the stats of all the games. For the whole history of the NBA, it's uh, open data, you can find it easily. So we load that, and uh, okay, the data is in JSON, and uh, I didn't uh, uh, normalize it, so the, data, the model of the data is a little uh, uh, strange, but anyway. It was just for a blog post, so I didn't take time on it. I just wanted to write the query already. And uh, you can see here, we're going to fetch from the, the, the stats of the games, the team that hosts, the guest, we're going to find them, see who wins. And uh, here we're going to find, see the mean over nothing. It's a window function, we saw that before. So it means that uh, you will get in the query every line, but also with every line, you will see the, the minimum number of defensive rebounds, DRB, that's defensive rebounds. So the minimum of them over the whole data set that is output from the query. So from the whole uh, history of the NBA in that case. And then you can see, uh, show me all the games with the statistics uh, that add the minimum number of defensive rebounds. So if I go back one slide, you see it's uh, exactly the question that is asked here. So I just, you know, that is written in English. This is the same thing written in SQL. That, that's about it. So when you have a struggle writing a SQL query, try to uh, phrase it into a single sentence in your native language because it's easier, but try making it into a single sentence. If you can make it into a single sentence, then writing the SQL is going to be easy, usually. And here is the statistics. So uh, actually there were four games. The minimum number of rebounds is 14. And uh, there are four games that happens to have uh, this number of defensive rebounds and the team nonetheless won the game. So I don't know what the, they do aggregate in MongoDB, but I don't use it, I don't care. <laughs> but if you use PostgreSQL, it's really easy to do and you have the, the result uh, fast enough. See, for the whole history of the NBA, it's, uh, on the laptop it was, uh, it was fast. Uh, and to finish the, with uh, some SQL queries, I, I like this one, it's a, a histogram uh, in, uh, in SQL, in, in, in just SQL. Some of you guys did see it already, okay. So you know about MVC model uh, view controller, so you can do that in pure SQL if you want to. Uh, that's the model, that's the controller, that's the view. The, uh, so the model is uh, the statistics from the games. The, the view here is uh, it's going to be uh, like a horizontal uh, bar histogram, uh, but because the slide the, the, the screen is not so wide, it's uh, you know uh, I only have 30 columns to do the, the histogram, so that's the view and the controller. So the here what I'm using is a width bucket. So I'm going to have uh, histogram buckets. You know that works histograms, right? You have, like when you go to the market and you buy uh, tomatoes or apples, uh, depending on the size of the apple, they are in different baskets, right? Because there, are, there is a norm, international norm, about the size of the apple and etc. Et so you, you have baskets and each basket is going to contain only apples of the same category, right? Here it's exactly the same thing, but uh, other by uh, the numbers of defensive rebounds that you have in a, in a game. So most of the games in the NBA history had between 25 and 35 defensive rebounds. Okay, so yeah, that's a simple query that you can see here. So you can do that like in a couple of minutes. Of course, nobody is going to write that uh, uh, like in one uh, setting. So you're going to write uh, maybe that first and then uh, you're going to play around with this because uh, it takes some time to have it exactly right. And then uh, maybe you didn't know how to make an integer range with uh, different values, uh, inclusive one, as you see, and then uh, you group by bucket. So you need to do some uh, with bucket, etc. So there is a lot of playing around with it, but uh, then you 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 uh, you play around with uh, joining the, the parts of the queries together and uh, etc. And then you have that is it enough, like a lunch break, like five minutes, and uh, you have a nice uh, histogram. You don't need a like uh, advanced uh, JavaScript day three GAs or whatever to do the drawing for you. It's just, you know, in the console, it's easy. Any questions? 
who wants to ask me a question? I, I, I like questions, so who wants to ask questions? Yes. I have a question. Uh, a few slides back. Yes. You, to make the join, you used uh, using lock ID, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'm going to try to pick the slide. It was a slide about yes. This one. This one. Yes. What? This is using lock ID. So the it's an uh, automatic on. Yeah. So I'm going to repeat the question for the recording. So the, the question is about this term here, using. So what does it mean to join using? So it means that the, the name of the, it's what you, uh, you guessed. The name of the column, lock ID, exists in both tables, blocks and location. So rather than saying uh, blocks.lockid equals location.lockid, you can use using. It means the same thing. It's another way to write it. It's shorter, so it's much nicer on the slide. If you integrate that in your code, you need to make sure that everybody in the team knows about it. Otherwise, they, are, they will have a difficulty reviewing it and they will not like you because they need to learn some more because they can, before they can review the patch. So depending on your team, it depends, but it's uh, okay. <coughs> Another question? Yeah. Yeah. So this works only if it's the same uh, column name in both tables? Yes, so the question is, uh, Using, it just, it's like a, if you want, it's a macro that is going to be expanded uh, and it's going to find the two tables that have the same uh, column name. Yeah. So if they don't, you have a error message back. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, you can use uh, Python uh, for a function in Postgres. Have you uh, tried? Yes, so the question is about uh, using Python code uh, in the backend in PostgreSQL itself. So it's called the PL Python, and you have two versions of it. So PL in uh, PostgreSQL, it means programming language or pluggable language. You can plug any programming language or about in PostgreSQL. Uh, you create extension PL Python. It's included by default in the PostgreSQL packaging. And then you can write Python code that is executed by PostgreSQL in the context of a query. So uh, I've been using that before uh, in very uh, specific circumstances. One project, for example, we uh, migrated data and the data source, they used, uh, so it was a little crazy, but because they used uh, MySQL, they didn't have much processing power. So what they did is they serialized Java objects into protobuf format into the database. And so the database only had like uh, an ID and the protobuf, uh, which contained three columns, actually. It was completely crazy. And so what I did is uh, load the binary data into PostgreSQL and then write a PL Python a function that would um, uh, deserialize the protobuf data. And then I could use that to transfer to the real uh, PostgreSQL tables. So in some cases, it's really nice to use. Another use case is when you want to import some code that you wrote in Python already, and you want to use it, for example, in a join like this. You could join and use the, here an operator that you wrote in Python because it, you use it in the backend code. And there now it makes sense in PostgreSQL. And so you could uh, export your uh, Python library and use it as a PostgreSQL uh, SQL operator. And uh, it works pretty nice. Uh, the only uh, thing I would say about it is uh, uh, first make sure that uh, it's really hard or impossible to do in SQL. So try to do it in SQL, and if it fails, or, and, or if you actually very much need the same code to run as in uh, the, the backend application, maybe see about uh, PL Python. It works well. Uh, do we have time for uh, another question? Last one. Yes. Last one. Who wants to ask the last question? Yes. Uh, I realize I, I'm uh, completely out uh, with SQL. Could you recommend some books or some? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a very nice question. I love it. So, no, no, not even. No. no. So the question is, which book would I recommend to run SQL? <laughs> and for those for those of you guys who uh, showed up a little late because it's early morning, it turns out uh, I wrote one. Just for you guys, so <laughs> just pick this one, and if you pick it, uh, be sure to use. Uh, oh, you need to click. Be sure to use this <laughs> code, right? So that was a very, very, very nice last question. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day.